So next we'll actually talk about what information you can obtain from the multiple sequence alignment. And I will give you some examples and we will discuss how this can be obtained. So if you look at alignment, at least traditionally you would say that how do you know if it's a good or bad alignment? And one, one way to do it is actually just look at it. And you can color it in different ways. So if, if it's a color, in this case it's colored just by amino acid types, so the hydrophobics, one color, etc. And you see that the left one, you have similar colors aligned in, in conserved amino positions. So you can see that you have prolines that are conserved, you can see that you have aspartates that are conserved, and lysine that are conserved, etc. So that makes sense so and you see that the gaps are more or less the same place so, and you can actually measure these features down here your conservation quality and consensus so there are some information that you can match from it so that would it would be in alignment it most likely is quite okay the second the one on the left you can see that you really have three different blocks like you have um, things that are we have these lysis that are more or less conserved in one position but in half of the sequence there's something called an alanine which is very different amino acid but well, so that, that would indicate that that part is not a good line. You have the gaps a bit spread up. It seems to be like three different blocks with gaps in different places. And you have, for instance, you have a lot of glycines that are conserved in, the, within the, in these blocks independently. So that would indicate there's probably something wrong with this alignment. On the other hand, nowadays when you have tens of thousands of sequences, you have, end up with a lot of gaps. So it's not easy to see if it's a good alignment. But, Good or bad, but at least it can give you an indication. If you're an experienced bioinformatician, you can at least judge that it, well, if the alignment was good, at least if it's not too big. So what, what can you expect? So if you take a good alignment or a decent alignment here, you can actually see, for instance, you have a region here in this alignment where you have more gaps than other gaps. So the first gap is quite conserved. It seems to be like three sequences on top that have that are a bit longer. And they have proline and glycine in there even. And others are, and the second one is a bit similar, it's not as conserved, but there are at least there are a few sequences that have extra residues, but most of them have a gap there. And then, then you have a region in the third region that all that have gaps in various places and the alignments are different places. So there seems to be groups of things that have different gaps. But so that would indicate that this is actually a loop, because there are gaps occurring in the structures, are mainly loops. You can find, for instance, a conserved proline glycine. That would turn down a beta term. So that you see here, you have proline glycine. And you see you have also some read of a lot of glycines there that are probably some kind of specific beta term or something that. So that conserved residues of particular types can give thing information. You can actually see here you have a hydrophobic and followed by hydrophilic amino acids in pattern two. So what could that, what could that be? That is quite likely to be a beta strand. On the surface of protein. So we mean that every second residue points inwards to so the hydrophobic core and every second points outwards. And uh, if you just have a short strand a stretch of like four or five hydrophobic amino acids, that will, would indicate it would be buried amino uh, beta strand. So, so and if you have more pattern of I plus three, I plus four with hydrophobic buried, that would indicate it's an alpha helix. So that's to see here. Uh, you can sometimes see if they have conserved cysteines. As you see here in the middle, there are two conserved cysteines. That could indicate that there is a disulfide bond between these residues. Uh, and also, if you have, for instance, histidine is conserved, that can indicate that you often have an active site residue, because histidine is often all active sites. So, the conserved residues, of course, provide extra information for the function. And to find these things often is important to color your alignment in different ways. You can color it by polarity, some uh, probability of being a beta strand or a helix, something like that. So you can find these uh, regions. So if you do that, you can, you can identify patterns. So here, for instance, you find that you have a, a conserved uh, glycine. Uh, here in the middle you have a glycine conserved mean indicate that it probably is a loop while you have some uh, conserved polar residues that are might indicate it's a beta sheet to the right 
And you see the difference here if you call the things for conservation first, you see you don't see very much, you see that some things are conserved, but if you combine it with call, calling of rest of properties, you can really see different properties. So it depends on what you want to look at because you can see these pro lines here that are very uh, conserved and also that are involved in the term probably and it's hard to see if you call it by by the that's conservation because everything is basically conserved. So 